Yeah, I hear you on that. Like a lot of times too, it's like the kind of background noise and it comes into like a cacophony, you know? And it, just, it sounds like static in the background. Uh, Barbara Aston, hello. Hello everyone listening online to Maple Syrup episode number 39. A special hello to Ryan Alexander G in the room. Maple Syrup History 39, Logic Course number three. I will be back I in under a minute. You can time me. I mean, seriously, I'll be like, oh, you know, five seconds legit. No, but like under 60 seconds, yes. My coffee is ordered. As I always say, let me take this moment to promote our wonderful coffee shop downstairs, Monica's. When this thing gets big, when it's huge, and people are like, you know, thousands, millions of people are watching, they'll be like, oh, there is a coffee shop on the campus of the University of Idaho called Monica's by St. Augustine Center, run by St. Augustine Center. It's very good coffee because this guy keeps saying that. And I do. So I'm going to go pick up my coffee from Monica's. Get it? Monica, St. Monica, St. Augustine's mom. Not a shout out to friends. Not we're talking about Monica, Joey Chandler, those people. St. Monica, mother of St. Augustine. I'll be right back. Barbara asked hello again. Um, 30 seconds. I'll be back with you. If the uh, last name is Spinus S-I-M-A-S. Okay. <laughs> we were trying to figure out which part of this is. I'm that one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Oh my God. I have trouble keeping names straight. And after a while, I start to think about it. I need somebody with a spare at it. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> Insert into my pea brain. Look at the I know. I hear the same. And it's like, and if you meet them, even if you think you've got it, blah, 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 and then there's some kind of gap in between seeing them again and may have it there and it's like, oh, yeah, I can see that. Yeah. 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 Back in the gym, the one with the gal, and he was on the party we had, you know. Yeah. Uh -huh. She had three models right on Wow. Oh, it was called in That's pretty amazing, actually. Yeah. Hello, Pat. Yeah. Oh, Will yeah. you send me an email? You gave me your card. I had it, I lost it. I was going to tell you because you gave it to me last Wednesday. Can I scribble it on a piece of paper right now? Do you have a computer to just email me? Because if you, my, my thing's online. Uh, if you just send an email to Vandal Catholic. Email you from my. That's what I mean. If you could just do that. Do I not know who's emailing? Just send it to intellect at vandalcatholic.com. Okay. And that's perfect because I, I had your email. It was Pat at, and I remember putting it in my computer. I lost it. I'm a total idiot. And then you weren't here on Monday. And I was like, I'm going to ask her when I see you, know, when I see you next, if you could just, yeah, send it to my email, then I'll have it right away. So I'll send you the syllabus, the it's channel, like intellect at vandalcap.com. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sincerely. The syllabus is online. Syllabus is online. None of your business. <laughs> um, I think so. I, exactly. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure it's just on, I think it's on vandalcap.com. I sent it to you though, because your email is B King. 
Yeah, so I sent you the syllabus. You should have it. If you need it again, if you need it again, just re-email me and I'll, I'll be happy to send it to you. I have it on my computer, obviously. So I just got obsessed with being able to find it. No, no worries. No problem. Uh, Schmidt is are the Dave coming? Yeah, he's trying to find. Okay. Wait, wait, yeah, it's the fall course. It lists on the Vandal Catholic website. Betsy, why would you say that to me? I don't and know. That's like strikes me as poor. That's yet so. But I'm just like misreading it. My something. New Year's resolution was to not even think of the numbers 2022. And you're bringing this up. It's fall 22 courses online. School. How dare you? Yeah, they don't. It seems to have not mixed. The, the 2023 okay. course is not so I'll, no that 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 is sincerely good to know so I'll try to fix that but anyone who needs a syllabus that I will mm -hmm. today when I check my email I'll have the syllabus and the whole YouTube channel for you as well because all the recordings are on there yeah. once more thank you sincerely you anyone else who nice. needs who needs the syllabus or ever email me that's you have it too I mean I, I have it because you emailed it to me but I was just but I mean for the rest of the year. I don't think I do. No, I don't think so. I'm not gonna lie. Guys, okay, let's let's talk let's talk of popular popular theory or whatever. I'm gonna wait till we start the class officially until Dave Schmidt shows up. But let me say, like, no, I honestly I don't know, guys. Like I, I think about this sometimes and I kind of feel like count your blessings. I think about how lucky I am that for my hippo lectures, especially, which are my, my pride and joy. My first hippo lecture is next Wednesday, by the way, FYI. Um, which will be Margot Himmel, my, my fiction piece, my, my apocalyptic fiction piece in the future. For my hippo lectures, I get on the low end, 35 people, on the high end, 70 people. I'm so honored. For our AMA, we have an AMA tonight, we get you know, over 100 people, especially when it's out at the restaurants. Oh, wait, isn't it here? It's here, here tonight, being catered. Yeah. Like that, um, That'd be awesome, yeah. Thank you. So, and, and with these classes, I feel so blessed. Barb, Barb, Brad is three people. Pat, Betsy, Trish is oh, wait, there's wait, nine. Our names are just B and B. <laughs> Pat, so you're, you're, you can be you can be but but Trish. Here. You can be but Trish. Okay. Okay. B A apostrophe. Okay. No, we, so it's a pretty good turnout for a class that doesn't have that's not accredited, whatever. So what I'm saying is I actually disagree with you. I don't like people come like they, I think you would come even more. I don't know. I honestly don't know. No, so I send I send out flock notes. I have like 113 people. People just Palmer, most people have jobs this time, let's say, or some classes. And then um, other people are just like, and I totally respect this. I've had so many students tell me, it's so nice. Like, I love your class often. I have a lab I have to do that time. I get it. Like, so I, I don't think it's not being online. I'll try to fix that, but it's like, I'm just so privileged and, and truly blessed that you guys are here. So I would do this class to myself. I would just record it and put it online, like, you know, like a podcast episode. But um, you should put a, like the, mon the mass times monica. Well, put a sandwich for it. Very logic. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Actually, There's the, you're right. That would see. That might be yeah, true. Yeah. I mean, you guys do it for me. You guys. You guys. You know, do something around here. Signage. And then we like. We right? have more. Yeah. She's like, no. Everyone in this room is so lazy. If they have these ideas, they don't want to put into action. And someone do something. I don't know. Uh, what was I going to say? Last. So if. I, yeah, no, of course not. Okay. Betsy, you can do no wrong with my eyes. There's nothing you can If you punch me in the face, I'd probably think like okay, there's nothing. I run out if I can, sure, of course. Okay, so last couple of housekeeping things. Again, welcome. But I started this class and I went and got my coffee. No one was here. It was just myself and Brad and freaking Ryan Alexander. I'm sauntering in like he owns the place. Uh, <laughs> Since that time, a bunch of lovely people have showed up. Well, mainly lovely. You know who you are, who's not including that category. But um, I will, I, it's better to say, my grandmother said, if you have nothing nice to say, so I won't continue, but you know who you are. But really, the so the first two episodes of the class have been fantastic. Logic Fundamentals 1 and 2. And Pat, it's more like when I send you these recordings, anyone wants to see them, you, you will see the kind of foundational stuff we've covered. And we've probably covered about 25 things. I have to send it by PDF, Betsy. I forgot to bring it in hard copy. I'm the worst. Okay. My little algorithm thing for you guys. Can that, you send it right now? I don't have it with me right now. I have to make it. Um, 
So I have I have the I have the general sketch of it. I don't have it ready to put to you. So I'll hopefully have a two by today. Um, okay. have a bunch of office hours today, so it's a lot of good time to get caught up on stuff. So nobody should come during your office hours. No, please come. Come anytime. Well, like, yesterday is a very intense day for me and a very good day. Thank God I teach five classes on Tuesday. It's awesome. Um, I have four classes at WSU from 7.45 to like three, and then I have a night class at UI, but asynchronous, like online. Super fun. I love it. Um, anyways, we're getting far afield. What I want to say was we had, we had the two uh, fundamentals of logic the first two weeks. This, the first two classes, this is the last fundamental day. We have actually a lot to come. We're going to go boom, 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 a lot of fallacies, a lot of points. After today, we will be comfortable, I believe, with like, look, we're, we have the foundational fundamentals. We understand like the difference between inductive and inductive reasoning. What is a syllogism? What is a straw man argument? Um, we talked last class about ambiguous and vague language. And like, you know, Mary likes to, you know, go fishing by the bank of the river or chase Manhattan bank, you know, confusing language, like picking out these things, which I said, again, is not so much important to me that you know the difference between ambiguity and vagueness vis-a-vis -vis, like um, definitionary precision, like how is it used in the field of logic? I would just like, you know, when my Brad made an excellent point, he's like, oh, until the cows come home. Brad's like, I know as an experience as a farmer that, you know, cows come home pretty fast. That's actually wrong, it's a fallacy until the cows come home, like a long time, a short time actually. I said it was, it was hilarious. Brad is a, a, a gentleman and a scholar of the highest wit. So it was very funny, but it was very true too. It was a great point that he made that some things are just not correct. So this whole class about identifying like, wait, what is missing there, what is false, whatever. Before I dive in, let me pull up these notes. Uh, I would say to all of you, because it's already 840, the class starts at 825, thank you for your patience. And yet you guys weren't here on time. So, <laughs> you know, we're sorry late because you
Ooh, yeah. People been complaining about Tiger Woods. I guess. Yeah. So, so uh, Ryan Alexander said, "Socrates, hello, Barbara. Welcome back. I dropped. Sorry. Uh, I said last class. Maybe you remember this, but my new computer is broken. My old computer is like built in broken. Right? The new one is broke on the fly. This one is a piece of fill in the blank. And we're trying to wait for the the little uh, lightning bolt to maintain, and it's doing that right now. If it breaks again, I'm sorry. We're about to get started." Anyone, if this is a new recording, uh, episode 39, Maple Syrup History, logic number three, we've covered two days of fundamentals, our last day of fundamentals. Before, what I was going to say is next week we get into textual analysis. And you can, anyone needs a syllabus, email me at intellect at vandalcatholic.com. Last two points, Ryan Alexander said, Socrates says, writing makes you forget stuff. I agree. I've noticed if I read a book, just read it, ingratiate myself in it, I do better. I take notes, which I feel like I'm supplementing, then the notes somehow bracketed off me. I forget stuff. Oh, I'm just I'm just focused on the things that I star. I don't know. So that it's a really good point. I never it's really cool when you highlight your Kindle book and then you can go to all your highlights and just go through all your list of Are you sure? Are you sure it's not illegal to highlight Kindle? That sounds like a crime. Um Kindle encourages it. In fact, mm. they'll show you other people's highlights. It sounds like someone that People are like, you are too technologically advanced for your own good. You are arrested. That's what it sounds like. Like you're you're, you're already not reading a real book and you're highlighting the screen. This is the fine citation. I'm letting you off of the warning. Then it can show you all notes. That's fair. No. Hey, whatever. I'm serious. I'm a huge. <laughs> True. Barb, are you are you an absolutist when it comes to if I'm gonna read a book, it's a hard copy book? Correct. That's how I am too. So you have great minds think alike. I was until um, my eyes got less good. Do I look like an optometrist? Ophthalmologist? Why do I? Why is this information relevant to me? <laughs> yeah, entomologist. Do I look like an entomologist? Do I look like a doctor who studies bugs in your eyes? I have an, an entomology ophthalmologist. No. Who? J. Henri Fah. Who's Fah? F-A-B-R-E. F-A-B-R-E. Okay. Why? Because he's an He's an entomologist? Yes, but like, like he really studied birds in nature. Cool. No, that is, that's very cool. Um, that's right. That's our class too. We could have a, we could have a, a from our building freight on board and Bob entomology class where we're trying to figure out what these acronyms mean. Guys, finally getting down to freaking business. Wow, Becca, like I, I'm blaming Becca. <laughs> I'm so happy to have all of you here. You guys are the best. Before, last point before we start these things, last fundamental, I mentioned last class when Clayton Zimmerman was here. Clayton Zimmerman, just an extraordinary guy, super cool guy. We're going to make a short movie in Augustus this spring. I don't think it'll be in lieu of one of my HIPAA lectures because I love doing HIPAA lectures. You know, I'm very selfish and guarded about that. So I make a movie called Clayton Zimmerman's Very Literal Afternoon, where he comes, I'm a doctor, and I'm like, what can I help you? And he's like, I have a train on my head. And it proceeds to be like, he's wearing a baseball cap that he's speaking uh, figuratively. I have a migraine headache, so I prescribe him all this stuff. And finally, my nurse, maybe I'll ask Nicole to be playing the, nurse, the role of the nurse. She'd be like, have you tried checking his head? I'd be like, nurse, you know, I, I have Harvard uh, Medical School. And she goes, no, have you tried to and she'd take off his cap? And I'll have a train running on his head, like a toy train, and that'll be the end of the movie. Miniature, like a toy. I mean, yeah. And, and she'll just pump it off. And like, oh, thanks. I feel much better. You know, wishing you a good out. And just a quick rub at me. Thank you. See ya. Take care. See you for bowling league next week. Like, after a whole movie, I don't think I'm thinking about having a flashback of like him and I working out. I'm like, let's do a kind of workout where you run into a wall, where you're like, this is the first time you're form. Just like this for 30 seconds. Just you're like, what is this film about? And the end, it was like he had an actual toy train stuff on his head. I guess the next day is Clayton, until you do the procedure, uh, kind of a one track of mine. Right. Ah. <laughs> and maybe, <laughs> listen, Dave Schmidt, Dave Schmidt, producer of the film, <laughs> <laughs> Dave Schmidt Studios. Dave, your thing is tomorrow, right? Why well, is tomorrow? Unless Dave Schmidt, Schmidt has, tomorrow. has an art show tomorrow. Right. Yeah, yes, I need to remember this. You know, this actually works perfect because we pick up our kids right around that time, okay. and it's four to six. We'll go over it. We'll go over it. Four to six. Yeah, go to see Dave Schmidt's art show tomorrow. Everyone online watching. Well, it's not my art show. 
So many. Let's be honest. We can be nice. <laughs> Everyone else is you, there. You, They're included too. Can you feed your kids dinner? You just go from place to place and give them cookies. That's what we do for dinner normal. How's that? How's that? <laughs> that is dinner every day. We just walk around and do cookies. <laughs> Another scene would be just the, uh, somebody saying, I'm going to go, they go play. He's going to hear someone say, I'm going to go fishing by the bank. And then you're going to go down like, okay. Yeah, Ryan, do you want to get this movie? Yeah, yeah. I want just, to, it has to be an awkwardly long scene of somebody just holding the fishing pole. It can be you. It can, be, can we include though at the end, like someone slaps you with a fish or something? Right there, there's both banks. You know, yeah. Well, fishing by the bank, are you on the bank, casting off the bank into the water, or <laughs> on the boat, casting towards the bank? What if your last name was Bank? Uh, what about the banks? They live uh, just just like on campus. Yeah. And Mary Poppins. Guys, what about gravity? You know, we're just saying random stuff. What about chairs? What about leopards? I don't know. This, this movie will include everything. That's if you like to be in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> I think should fit right in. I'm not gonna lie, I reserve right to cut and edit any way I want. So you might be like, I didn't do that theme. Uh oh, why did you do that? But I reserve right to stick license. Okay, let's get started. Really, you're right. <laughs> you volunteer your house to be in the movie? That'd be sick. Seriously, like to have like on scene in Fort Russell, that'd be amazing. That's like that's like red carpet stuff. Okay, I'll we consider it. Red carpets. You can actually put a red carpet. Can you put a red carpet out in the street? Okay, guys, we're having way too much fun. Let's get started. Pat is like, I gave up my morning to do something, probably more important than this, and this guy's an idiot. Like, he's not, he's never going to start. But you just missed your vocation. You're kind of comedian. I am. Guys, I'm, so I, oh, maybe, you are. maybe I am. I'm sorry. There is, there is this guy who did live streams last year, and he, uh, I used to watch a lot of his live streams, which is so embarrassing, I'll admit. It was a guy speaking into a camera for three hours, right? But he's this guy, he's a canceled comedian, and he made a, a video of himself, like the philosopher and the comedian. And I think the whole thing was this like skit the entire time. He's like complaining about society. But, like he did this whole skit how actually the Swedish people are the new world order. And he's like, Ikea was invented to have couples divorce each other. <laughs> and like, he went this whole thing, like that Swedes are actually trying to like destroy the family structure by creating Ikea and getting like husbands to not be able to assemble the stuff and wives get mad at them. And, and it was just like that the garden of Eden was actually the North Pole. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's just, we're finally getting the material, all right? So a lot to discuss today. First, like the meaning of meaning. What I want is this point number one today, the meaning of meaning. I will simply say about this. We said last class, right, that logic is a field, a profession, people who are in this professionally, professors, logicians, philosophers, where precise meanings matter, right? I said two things. Precise meanings matter, and often these meanings seem to be, at least on face value, indistinguishable from one another. Like vague and ambiguous seems very, very similar. It can be like idiosyncratic too. And yet they're not. And I said, my plumber's logic, my character is no longer on the board, but the guy that I had before, Xavier, Big Teddy, right? The plumber from class number one. I just want Big Teddy to be able to be like, I said to you earlier, this seems vague. This seems like it's a personal kind of expression. I gave the example of me and my friend saying Jabba, that baseball pitcher. But it's good here to stop after covering like 30 terms to, to talk about always trying to be as precise as we can with the meaning of meaning. And that sounds tautological and repetitive, but but yeah, like what are what do you mean by this? Or better yet, wait for it, define your terms. In all kind of investigation discussion, let's define our terms. What are we talking about? Ryan Alexander and all people in the jurisprudential arts and sciences very much um, appreciate this. I'm sure, like in a case, like what is being tried, what is being said, what is the admissible evidence, what is this, what is this person allowed to say, what what are the limits of the law, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what is the meaning of meaning? What are we talking about? And even perhaps thinking about going to a coffee shop with a friend with divergent mm -hmm. points of view, Trish, you and I are going to have a debate on American politics or whatever, but you know, what are we actually talking about? I just have this free for all kind of like, you know, devolving into insults or cliches. Are we just talking about like economic policies in America? Okay. So please, during this discussion, the meaning of our meaning, the, the, the base kind of lowest common denominator of what we're talking about would be economic policy. 
let's just stay on that, right? Maybe it helps to clarify, maybe it helps to make more tidy the discussion um, that we're having. Okay, moving on. We're gonna move on very fast with a lot of terms. Uh, logicians say there are three, pur three purposes of language. Ready? Informative, expressive, directive. We're gonna break them apart, obviously, point by point. Or you can say information, expression, direction. What is the informative function of language? A, what is information, informative function? What is it, remember? These definitions are very close to the best. They often seem to be embedded in the statement itself. They're very precise. First purpose of language, the informative function. What is that? Do tell. I pray tell you tell me. What is the informative point in language? Inform. Yeah, exactly. Just communicate information. The informative function communicates information. Wow, duh. Yeah, but yeah, logic is good that way. Logic is good that it shatters our preconceived notions of obviousness. And of course I know that, and it should be obvious, but it's good to say it out loud. What do you think the expressive function B of language is? What am I saying? To express emotions. Thank you, perfect. The second word is especially genius, thank you. Not just to express stuff, but right, emotions, feelings, attitudes. The expressive function taps into emotions, feelings, attitudes. And finally, the directive function, of course, is to cause or prevent action. Conduit, to do something or stop something from happening. So once more, three purposes of language, information, expression, direction. Information simply communicates information, facts. Communication of facts. Thus the facts, please. Expressive functions, you said so well, Pat, not just expressing stuff, really emotional feeling, kind of like, you know, attitudes about things. And the directive functions to is, is directed directly towards action. The directive function is calibrated towards action, towards preventing or causing um, being a conduit, a tributary source to actually doing something. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what is the difference? Moving on. Again, we're on the point number three. We're going to move on a lot. We're going to go, 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 go. Trish, if, if in that first bag that you have, if there wasn't a writing utensil, I'd be like, that's surprising. Yeah. What is the difference between a tautology and a contradiction? What is a tautology? What is a contradiction? Remember, I'm sorry for being a broken record. All we're doing today is the last class we'll do this before you get textual stuff. It's the first half of the semester, so to speak, even though it's only like 7%. All we're doing is defining terms. All we're doing is defining, sketching out. We've already done a lot of that in the last two classes, but really this class will take it to the apex. A tautology is basically the same term as identical to itself, and the contradiction is saying that two things are, which are, cannot be held at the same time are true. Good, very good. Could we have a spelling on that word? Yes, tautology. T A. U T O L O G Y. Tautology. There you go. It's a good Scrabble word. It's probably triple triple words for. Two things which are identical. I'll give you an example. Ready? Two terms. Two terms, not just two things which are identical. So like dog A and dog B are identical in my mind, but they're they're not okay. So a a tautological statement is always true. Okay, I'll give you an example of tautology. Ready? Bachelors are unmarried. Right. That, that is a tautology. Bachelors are unmarried. A, a bachelor is always unmarried. It's always true. Once a bachelor marries, he ceases to be a bachelor, right? You cannot have a married bachelor. Then that does not exist. Bachelors are married. Where a contradiction is always false. Triangles have four angles is a contradiction. A triangle cannot, a triangle is three angles. It cannot, so it's always false. Okay, remember we talked about in the first class, our arguments cogent, are they valid? You know, how strong is the argument? Deductive reasoning, always true. If, the premise, if it falls from the premises, inductive reasoning, Brad and I were talking about this before class, you know, you can have true premises, but a more general kind of conclusion, we don't know. Tautologies and contradictions. Tautologies are almost unnecessary statements. The reason people apologize for tautologies is there's no need to say that. It's like the wet rain is a tautology. Rain is always wet. If, 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 if H2O in its form is gaseous, it is no longer rain. It's, it's gas evaporating. Or if it's hard and it's ice, it's not, if it's rain, if it's liquid, it's wet, it's always wet, 
right? Like rain is wet. When is rain not wet? Give an example of dry rain. That's not possible. Mm -hmm. So it, it would be sloppy writing, right? And this is, yeah, exactly. Which implies, which implies that, that that's funny and a good example of, in that point, you've departed from realism and you're using a colloquial expression. You're, you're, you know, uh, you're no longer de dealing in reality. Now you become almost a poet. You move from science, scientist to poet, right? It's poetic expression. Scientifically speaking, rain is always wet. So it's not necessary to say. Yes, go ahead. When there was a big fire, it rained ash. It yes, ash. but that's but that so that that's yeah. rain is it exactly exactly it is raining ash is ash is raining down right it's the, the process the active process I'm talking about actual rain precipitation falling from clouds is always wet talk to others do you see why the meaning of meaning is it meaning of meaning sick like mm -hmm. S I C sick yeah exactly okay bachelors are married tautological triangles four angles contradictory. What is the difference between a priori and a posteriori statements? What does this mean? Aquinas is happy right now. He's smiling down from heaven. St. Thomas Aquinas prayed for us. He loves talking about stuff like this. We're going to read six weeks, no, uh, six class of Aquinas, three weeks of Aquinas later in the semester. What is the difference in a priori, a posteriori statements? A priori. I'm just saying one means before and the other means after. Yeah. Like, prior, yeah. posterior, yeah. Prior, prior, before, posterior, after, post. Okay, good. Well, what is, which is which? An a priori statement is kind of something you have to believe to get anything done in the world of logic in the first place. And a, a posteriori statements are going to be things that follow from those a posteriori statements. So you have, you have to believe that like logic does not admit of contradiction to really derive anything from that rule. You can't prove it. Aristotle goes on at length in the metaphysics talking about that. In fact, he basically says the only way to convince people to deny that principle of non-contradiction is by, you know, pushing them into wells, or it's like, or it's like arguing with the plant. You know, there, there isn't any way to do it. Yeah. Okay. He basically says like you have to argue with that person. Is like there's a well there. But you can't say that there isn't and is a well there at the same time. You're just going to walk around it. Okay. And, and so not to get so. not to get too confusing. Sorry. Uh, no, 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 no. I, I swear that sounded like I was saying, oh, you, dude, your comments are always so epic and genius. Thank you. I'm serious. Sincerely. I love, I love that you're this guy. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna, I gotta stop because I'm become really sick of fancy how awesome you are, but seriously, I'm not saying that to you. I'm saying in general, I'm saying that I was beautiful. That's a great point. I'm saying all these definitions to make them as clear as possible. A priori does not need empirical evidence. It's just, it, it is, it's obviously true. It's necessary. Whereas a posteriori after is contingent needs evidence. Here's where I, my, my lead in before, I'm not getting too, too um, complex and getting you terms that our plumber's logic doesn't require, but I want you, you have all the terms. This is the difference between analytic and synthetic statements. Analytic statements are either true or false in of themselves, so a priori. They just are, like they're, they're exactly, yeah, like arguing with a plant, like you can get you nowhere. Like it just, it, and it is what it is. And they're, they're, no more time needs to be spent where synthetic statements that are constructed need evidence they're contingent so, Conti they're contingent upon things but, but really quickly to answer this question a priori just means does not need evidence an a priori statement is something that can be known with no evidence just true okay uh again like maybe the yeah the kind of um i would say in, in the famous syllogism you know all men are mortals that, is, that don't need evidence for that. that's obviously true everyone knows that they, they don't spend time on that you can investigate that with evidence, but it's, it's obvious. But a posteriori, a posteriori argument means it falls from the, the evidence. Now, Aquinas, let me talk about how Aquinas did this. It was awesome. Saint Anselm, I believe, said faith seeking understanding. Beautiful, right? We as believing Christians, Catholics, believe everything our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ taught, the infallibility of scripture, the magisterial protection of church. We have faith. In this day and age, people will pit falsely faith versus reason. But like Pope John Paul II said, and this in the first class I said this could be the model for, for our whole course, uh, faith and reason are like two wings upon which one rises to the contemplation of truth, faith and reason, both. A lot of kind of, they would identify themselves like Bible-believing Christians, some of our Protestant brothers and sisters are the most evangelical, anti-ecclesiastical structure bent, no, no, just faith, just faith. I don't need science. And Aquinas actually says, belief in God is not an a priori thing. 
And we actually come to belief in God a posteriori. And that's his five proofs we're going to talk about. That if you put a guy on an island, he's not going to automatically a priori just be like, oh, there's a God. But, but when you reflect on the world, the idea of like contingency and divine designer and how, why is it that every animal of these vegetative souls, as, as he would say, like bees and stuff, why do bees know what to do? Why is everything so ordered? Oh, there must be some ultimate source. That evidence leads you to belief in God. So Aquinas is against the knee-jerk kind of like Bible Southern preacher. And I love the American South, as I think you know. But he's against just that, like, well, I just believe. It's like, do believe. Praise God. In fact, it says in the Bible, without faith, you cannot please God. We have to have faith. But we have faith seeking understanding. And the, the proofs of God existence, the five ways that we'll talk about, famous five ways in Aquinas, that's just one part of a million things to talk about with him. But he's like, we actually, he believes we don't have knowledge of God, his existence a priori, but from that which we can observe, a posteriori, the evidence is all around us, God's belief. And therefore, he makes a stronger argument for theism in general, and of course, in the Trinitarian belief and the whole wonderful interconnected nexus of the Catholic faith. He says that it's actually a stronger argument against atheists, that you say to Johnny atheist, no, it's not, hey, shut up, just believe, you're a heathen. It's like the evidence is all around you. Let's both pretend we're just searching for facts. God's fingerprint is everywhere. We come to believe in God a posteriori of that which is available to our senses. Very, very cool. All right, what is a circular argument? It's kind of obvious. Um, a, a thing can't be its own definition, right? My mother actually had an experience with this. She was in, uh, in a store, and my mom speaks better English than I do. I say that like jokingly, but what I mean is like, my mom has been in the country now. She's from Poland. She was born in Poland. My dad's an American. They met in the 80s. She's an American citizen, has been in America for 40 years, I guess. And she's perfect English. But still, it's not her ultimate native language. And so she was in a store recently, even. She didn't recognize this word, prodigy. She's like, I don't She wanted to buy a, 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 a shirt for like our, our boy, one of our boys. And she asked this woman, she's like, hey, just what does this word mean? I've never seen this word, prodigy. And the woman was like, uh, prodigy. I think it means a prod prodigy of something. It's like, no, that is a circular argument. A prodigy is not a prodigy of something. Prodigy is, means something else, but it's not its own definition. So can you tell me what coffee, what makes up, what, what is, what is coffee? Coffee, you know, ultimately, coffee's coffee, man. No, but what is coffee? Oh, it comes from cacao bean or whatever, coffee beans. Yeah. Well, okay, that's something, right? But what is beer? Well, it's fermented in this way. Beer, beer is a brewski, bro. No, <laughs> you know, like a thing is not itself, you know, right? Even if it is identical in itself in tautological things, like a, a, a brewski is always a beer is an example of tautology, right? Is that true? What is true? I mean, I don't know about brewski beer. Mm -hmm. I think IPAs aren't brewskis. IPA is not beer? How is IPA not beer? I, I think it's beer. I just don't know if it's a brewski. I yeah. think so. Okay, so you're saying brewski is more of a frat guy kind of natty yeah, ice kind of thing? Yeah, I don't think Talking. You know what? I I, 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 I think I side with you now. You're right. Brewski is kind of really low brow, so maybe not. You're right. Maybe like a, a Chimay Blue, you know, Monk Trappist Abbey or Wall beer is not a brewski. I don't know. It's, it's, it's it's like anything you brew, eventually, it's cheap. Let's write a dictionary. Like, guys, it's it's just, I, someone needs to sing. want to sing the Folgers theme song, speaking of coffee. No, the best know. part of waking up is Folgers in your cup. Remember that, like the nineties? Yeah. They got really yeah. into it, and the guy with somebody was like, "The best part of waking up is Folgers." Like he really get like Folgers in in your cup. Like he'd really get into it. Like I, I miss that man. Does not have that commercial thing anymore. I miss Folgers. Is cool. That what is it? Is that also Folgers? What is yeah, that? I think it's Folgers Crystal, and they're you know black and white commercial or something in Bitter Sea, and uh, the guest couple, um, the husband said, you know, I'm kind of really good. and his wife, <laughs> oh yeah, she would never stop bubble. Like, oh. <laughs> nice. <laughs> what a burn on women! Like yeah. I used to make garbage coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and these are Crystal. This is instant coffee. Are you talking about drugs? Drug, right. drug advertisement at the same time? Drugs. Crystal coffee. <laughs> Is that why you're not a fan? It got popular for a reason. Exactly. 
it's true they used to put cocaine in Coca Cola, right? Yep. That sounds bad. That sounds like a bad idea. That's good people, part, I know. I think people brew still have a healthy use of the cocoa beans. Some people do. What uh, recreation? Yeah. Yeah. Like, like a, a tea, a out tea. okay. You chew it so it's not cool. refined, so you're not getting it. That's cool. So yeah. Hey, more. everything in moderation. I, I will confess, I'm of the dare generation. Like, we used to have cops come into our thing, dare. Uh, I'm thinking what the acronym stands for drugs and resistance education, something like that. Drug drug and alcohol resistance education. Mm -hmm. I had like a dare t shirt. Everyone, anyone know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Dare. Yeah. I, know what you're talking about. I just get just like I in my life, like I, I don't smoke anything. Yeah. This is not some kind of like confession, like, or oh, I'm so what do you drink? I drink the the the, the things that I use or I, I caffeine, I absolutely love coffee, I love beer. But I, I don't I've never done any drugs. I just that's not my thing and thank god maybe as well but um so just to say where i'm coming from i'm not someone these like new age guys who's like oh, oh man these cool like you know plants these guys use. that is cool that is cool everything in moderation like if these people have this uh what's it called like you said use for a tea and maybe maybe it helps people sleep or it's a relaxing it's it's used, it's used for um, high altitude and travel and things that's like that. great yeah. then that's like that's a beautiful god design yeah. it's awesome but I drank the special tea that you drink when you go to Cusco. Hey, Betsy, if anyone tells you this is this is special tea, you're in, it's your it's your fault at that point. It's your fault. Hey, Betsy, I need special brownies. Do you want to try? It's your it's your fault. That's that's your fault at that point. Yeah, but well, what was it like? You don't know. Wait, you don't know. Wait, you don't know because you don't remember anything for three days. That's what you think. <laughs> No, 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 no. I, I got to Cusco and we got given the tea. I went down to dinner, but I had a terrible, terrible headache and it just went good back. Bless you. Added the like, like, from the altitude, yeah. but then the rest and of the time I could run and step there. So it wasn't like. What is the altitude? 10, 12,000 feet, like high, uh, like in the tens? I think it's like. I'm guessing 13,000 feet. I'm going, I always go at 13,000. Altitude. I know where we're at. Stop moving. Okay. Yeah. Um, elevation of 11,200 feet. Dang it. Wow. And I was coming from Seattle wrong. to Dang. sea level, you know, so it's. Um, Betsy, get it? Nice joke, by the way. Seattle is sea level. Good. <laughs> Seattle. Let's get back to work. Betsy, thank you for that. That's a great story. Um, definitions. What have we covered so far? Because we're getting back on track. Well, we, we've covered the meaning of meaning, three purposes of language, information, expression, direction, tautology and contradiction, a priori, a posteriori, especially in proofs of God, Aquinas, a lot of good stuff, right? Like Schmidt, a lot of good stuff. Uh, something cannot be itself, a progeny of something, definition of progeny, no, not. Um, definitions. Definitions have to follow the Goldilocks rule. What is the Goldilocks rule? Just yeah. right. Yeah. Right. They cannot be too broad or too narrow. A definition cannot be so broad that it means nothing. Chesterton famously said, and we'll cover him for three classes, the point of an open mind is time to shut on something. It can't be so open-minded, just always filtering nothing, you know, not retaining anything. It can't be so broad, it's it could be anything, and it can't be so narrow that um, no one knows what that means. Or it's kind of like I had, I had a, a, a mentor when I was a history graduate student, I, I really respected him. He lamented, bemoaned that historians don't, it's not enough just to study this one cockroach now, instead of all of the entomological species, just one cockroach. Now I only study the left hind leg of the cockroach, right? It's way too narrow, like so what? Like when does it become so focused that it says nothing about it? A definition must be Goldilocks. It must, you know, reconcile broadness and narrowness into just like precision. It, it must be just right, just like Goldilocks is porridge. I have a sister named Lloyd Goldilocks, Surprise, surprise, makes great oatmeal and porridge. All that family, always the right, really. I'm, this isn't funny, it's serious. My, one of the greatest, one of the greatest moments on childhood, big sis Goldilocks making us breakfast, awesome. Um, yeah, she had a hard time finding a husband. People were like, there's no way your name's Goldilocks. And she would burst into tears and be like, woe is me that my parents named me Goldilocks. My <laughs> parents. Yeah. I think I don't know, I'm just thinking of problem definitions. Yeah, no one cares though. Okay. I think the bears would have liked it though. Go ahead. <laughs> and you know, bears, yeah, exactly. it was come by the name Goldie. It's by the name Locke. They thought it was too hardcore. 
<laughs> girl named Locke. It was like a Bond character. Go ahead, Brian. Brian. So I'm thinking of the problem, like definitions and universals. You can't, the one reason you can't define too precisely is that you're just thinking yeah. um, an individual thing. So you can't define the species of dog by just a dog. This particular, Fido, this particular dog, because it's not a definition anymore. You're just talking about Fido. So if your definition is too narrow, you're getting away from genus or species, and then you're getting into a particular. Excellent. And Thank then you, you can't make any generalization. Yeah. Hey, that. And, and, then, and then that breaks your logic. You can't say all A or B because you don't even have an all yeah. to talk about. Thank you. That is fantastic. As always, you have such a great way of, like, you know, contextualizing. That's right. That's exactly right. An idea of genus and species, family, all the kind of, like, Toxicological, I think, right? Talk or toxology. What, what is the the taxonomy? Well, uh, the way Aristotelian. I'm talking about Aristotelian genes and species. Okay. Not of the name. Well, so even even like yeah, even within philosophical terms or in the animal kingdom, like certain mm -hmm. classification has to have, as you explained, a way of distinguishing between something that's a family and too broad and that the individual thing you're talking about. Okay, more on fallacies. Time heals all wounds. Time is money, therefore money heals wounds. Fast, right? Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's, a, that's false. A stroll along banks, this has been our most popular thing, but like, yeah, right? Do you mean banks of river or finance banks? Uh, Amphiboly, wow. Big Teddy, our plumber doesn't like this. He's like, when I hear ampha, I wanna like, talking about amphibian, it's like the, the, the extent of my knowledge with ampha stuff. A exactly, who cares, right? <laughs> A-M-P-H-I-B-O-L-Y. Amphiboly means multiple meanings, but it's about like sloppy construction, kind of fog of war thing, where it's like, ooh, what are you kind of confusing? It's going back to earlier, turns out vagueness in statements, which is not the same, can be kind of paired with or paired against equivocation, which means actual mul multiple meanings. Brian Alexander, one of his first examples, talking about equivocation, that the shell game people play of switching the meaning midstream, and that, that's a fallacy. That's this equivocating fallacy. Um, the accent fallacy. What is the accent fallacy in a sen in a sentence? We're getting so you point out somebody's French accent, say, 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 yeah, go back to Paris, exactly. Go back to Paris. See ya, dude. You're a legend. Have a good day. Uh, what is the what is the accent fallacy? Anyone know? So it's like, okay, uh, you're not really gonna do that, right? Accent on that. All of a sudden, that's Whoa, right? You really aren't going to do that. You really aren't going to do that, right? It, accenting a certain word, juxtaposing against others. I mean, I guess you probably could use it correctly, but it, it highlights or heightens that and perhaps can lend fallacious understanding too. This is, a, this is a written fallacy, you know, obviously it's more than a spoken one. Of course, I, I, I acted out the accent. But usually you'd see it like in, in a statement, right? Like it would be sloppy to, you know, if it's probably... I would probably continue to say here and say um, sloppy emoji exclamation point kid speak. Is, is, would you say that the accent fallacy is used for misdirection? It could be used for misdirection. I want you to focus on this, not here. Look here, not there. Yeah, totally right. Right. It's confusing. It's confusing. <clears throat> I would say this is in the family of like when people use exclamation points wrongly or you know commas, bad punctuation, sloppy writing. Where, where maybe you're being confused, not intentionally, but your focus, your focal points are being diverted unnecessarily and incorrectly. Next one, ready? Slippery slope argument. Um, people used to wear like Amish style clothes. Then they were like wearing like jeans. Now they wear short shorts. Everyone's gonna be walking around naked pretty soon. Slippery slope argument. Now, I might say even, right, almost might agree, oh man, like we, as Catholics, like, love the virtue of modesty and stuff. I agree, I'm not, I'm not saying that modesty is good in men and women. And I, by, by the way, this is where it's like a truly sexist, misogynist argument where these guys are like, oh, women should not wear these clothes, but they'll walk around. Like a, a guy walking around no shirt on, on, you know, like whatever can be just as, you know, tempting to women as, you know, the classic woman in, in a too short skirt or something. I think it works both ways. I'm all for modesty. But this, this is a slippery slope argument. No, okay, so go ahead. I've seen that, um, I've forgotten who the uh, person is who, who was doing comedy and he had a, a chart about how, um, how um, what percent of each 
age range in the population was gay and had and went to a date when we all be gay. Exactly. Yes, yeah. that that would exactly be it. Yeah, exactly. That that's that's very good. So it's like if, if anything, any kind of data seems to imply. Um, exponential leaps and bounds, the slippery slope is taken to a, to an extreme level. Pretty soon it's going to be 100% of whatever it is. Um, right. Okay. False dichotomy. Remember? False dichotomy, one of the most classic fallacies. What is the false dichotomy? Standard chart. I can't remember. I think it was just, uh, Let's agree charts are good, right? Charts are always helpful. <laughs> what, is, uh, what is a false dichotomy, guys? A false dichotomy is pretending there's only two options when in fact there are more. I don't support uh, capitalism, therefore I'm a socialist. I hate the Democratic Party, so obviously I'm just the extreme Republican. So basically there's only two options. No, there's more, but you're pretending there's only two. No, no, that's right. Yeah, exactly, yeah. false dichotomy, dichotomy, two options. Yeah, okay, I hate the Idaho Vandals, therefore I love the ISU Bengals, right? It's a false dichotomy. There's a, I don't, just because the ISU Bengals are our rival doesn't mean that because I don't like the Bengals, I love ISU. I could hate them both or whatever, right? It's a false dichotomy. The political thing is probably the best way. Betsy, if Betsy's like, you know, I really, really can't stand the extreme left, the false dichotomy, well, then she's obviously alt-right. No, she could be a moderate. She could be Green Party. She could be a monarchist. There's more options than just the two being presented. Mm -hmm. But this is often used to coerce people, right? Yeah, oh, Barb, sure. Barb, you're, you are against... Uh, you are against people being like super rich in a non-Christian way and being misers. Well, then why haven't you given away all your money? You know, it's like, that's not the only option, right? You can, right. third option, you can give to the poor, but with, you know, common sense, help your family. It's not either become totally impoverished, give everything away or just stay, be a miser, right? False dichotomy. Mm -hmm. It's one of the most popular ones, right? It's one of the most popular dichotomies. I mentioned this once before, I think, but you see these signs all the time, both for me is both for kids. Exactly. Oh, yeah. 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 No, it's not. By the way, it's not you. Exactly. Yeah. It's not. That's not the only option. If you don't vote for this candidate, you hate women. No. Right. Like that. It is always set up like black and white. And you're, no. Yeah. Yeah. You hate women. You hate. You know minorities. You know. They don't vote. You hate women. Or if you do vote, you got a history here. All the campaign. Yeah. <laughs> or if you don't think about silence, you have to sing the Folgers song. <laughs> the best part of waking up. No one wants to sing this with me, guys. Folgers in your cup. In your cup. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Pat. That was really good. Pat, you have a good voice. That was good. That was like commercial level good. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, okay, so straw man argument. What is a straw man argument? This is bad, guys. This is an actual crime. It's when you torch scarecrows on people's farms. <laughs> uh, this is property damage for its farmers, burning scarecrows. Because you're like, this guy is a really cool scarecrow, and surprise, surprise, it scares the crows, and they don't harm his crops. I want to harm his crops financially impoverish him by burning his scarecrow. Straw man argument. <laughs> yeah, so you... So you um... So you make an argument that um, everybody would agree with because you set up something. No, but you're trying to find. I need to find it. Burning scarecrows to tap the economic warfare. In the straw man argument, basically finding a shill or a scapegoat, basically um, you're blaming the problem on. Kind of no. Okay, here's here's some boy scarecrow. It's attacking not the opponent's real position, a character of the position. So Dave Schmidt, I'm running for office against Dave Schmidt, and Dave Schmidt's real position is Dave Schmidt wants to bring back traditional values to Moscow. He has said, I would like it if men and women in Moscow, Idaho, when I'm mayor, respect each other more. Again, this is a stupid analogy, but just follow along. Like, and, 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 and you would be arguing that a vote for Dave is keeping women barefoot. Yeah, so, so I'll get there, exactly. Yeah. So, so Dave says, Dave, some, someone, someone presses him on it. Moscow Pullman Daily News press him. Dave, what do you mean by traditional values? And Dave says, by traditional values, I mean that men and women should come have the old stability of that they are you know, two better halves. They, they, they belong together in respect. Not just as you know, the marital union, but like men and women are not enemies. There's too much like men, women hate men, men hate women. I want to go back to men and women see each other as allies. I want to, uh, you know, have empower women who want to stay home. 
and be stay-at-home moms while also empowering women who want to work. I want to just work for better male-female relations. And so he says all that. And then I say, if Dave Schmidt gets elected, he said every woman's going to be in America. Every woman's going to be barefoot at home. He never, that's a straw man argument. He mm. never, ever said that. That is he a traditional denied, But he never denied it. <laughs> but no, the exact straw man. And so, so everyone's like, well, I can't vote for Dave Schmidt. I'm going to be barefoot and pregnant, like you said. That's not what he's for, but it's a great argument. It's a great fallacy for my thinking. If I can get you thinking he stands for that, then you're not going to vote for him. He never said that. He, in fact, said he wants to donate more money to helping young girls go into STEM and young girls, you know, be career women. He just said, at the same time, I like to empower more women who want to be traditional stay-at-home moms, whatever. And so I jump on that and say, Dave wants all women pregnant in the kitchen, you know, barefoot in the kitchen. So attacking only one part. No, no. Okay. I'm attacking a mate. He says he something, I make up an extreme caricature of something like that. Oh. He said traditional values explain. I say, well, traditional values is barefoot in, in the kitchen. He never said that, but that's that's in the orbit of traditional values. So I attack that thing I made up about him. Okay. So as so a barber, you say, you say um, you're you're running for president and you say, I I will I believe America should defend its allies. Fair point. In, in the foreign policy, you, you say like if anyone attacks NATO, Putin or China or whoever attacks NATO, America should should help their allies. And I say, Barb is a warmonger who claims America should attack wherever they want in the world. No, she never said that. She said she was def defensive. And I say she's going out looking to fight people, right? It's a caricature. It's not what you said. But if the voting public can say, oh, yeah, she's a warmonger, I win. Straw man. Straw is legit. Straw man is a good one. Barb is running for office. And she um, so she doesn't want to be um, tied down by modern electronic gadgets. Right. And Barb wants to ban social media. Right. right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Straw man argument. Straw man is very good. You see how often our political elite uses this. Republicans, Democrats, all of them do this. No, this guy actually said this. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. You said that because it's very, you wish he said it, in fact, because it's very convenient and damning for their campaign, but they actually never said that. Or what is a red herring argument? Very similar, seems. Red herring is to change the subject, divert focus on your stuff. So we're talking about, again, Dave and I are political opponents, and Dave, uh, the reporter asked me, you know, Ms. Mr. Krzyzewski, you know, you, if you became mayor, what would you do to address the water crisis in Moscow? Well, have you seen what Dave said about technology? Red herring. <laughs> yeah, but well, before I answer that, let me ask my opponent, what he thinks about the idea of saying that people can't drive cars anymore? Red herring. I'm not, I'm, the question was about energy policy and diverting it, attacking him. I'm not making up something maybe, or maybe it's red herring plus strong, man, but it's like red herring just means I refuse to end. Like, hey, labor secretary leader, uh, studies show that high school kids have a literacy rate lower than ever. How do you respond? I think a really important thing we've been doing in our society is working on building more parks in the city. It's been really good, red herring. And they ask me a question about education and I'm talking about parks. Like I change the subject. Change the subject is red herring. Yeah, that's the. But so let, let, let's say let's say politics equals red herring and straw man. Yeah. What do you have to do to be a politician? Be a crook. Be a liar. Be good at shaking hands. Be decently good looking. Have nice suits or dresses if you're a woman. Whatever. Awesome. I mean, Hillary Clinton power suits. Um, and be good at red herring and straw man. <laughs> and you're there. You can be elected, right? I already told you guys, if I ran for political office ever, a governor, I would come out front and have my campaign release fake scandals about me. Because then I, <laughs> every, every, every week I'd be clear. Like, I'd be like, tell them that I'm, I'm doing this secret oil deal with Saudi Arabia. <laughs> that I want to divert all of Idaho's resources to Saudi Arabia. And then it turns out it's not true. I'd be like straw manning myself. And they'd be like, wow, he's cleaner than a whistle. Like, all these scandals. And then I'd blame it on my own. Well, you heard all this because they said I did <laughs> That's what I would do. That. That, that's a pretty winning strategy. The next step. Yeah. Yeah, the next step of, that's the next step of psychological yeah. warfare. Make up fake scandals about yourself, set the bar really low, and then it turns out you're clean and you're be you look better than ever. <laughs> like, no one wants to elect me if I'm just a good guy. But everyone wants to elect a good guy who's accused of doing foreign shady deals who's clean, actually, because pretty good, right? Pretty, pretty sneaky. That must, my campaign slogan would, would be. All the things you thought he did, he did it. Well, the most important thing is name recognition, right? So if you can get a lot of publicity with your name, and that's not true. Like Donald Trump, anyone, no one knew who he was before the campaign. Name recognition is not that important. Yeah. <laughs>
But you're saying like most people knew Donald Trump? Like that, I don't think so. He was kind of, I don't know. <laughs> right, of course, of course. Mm-hmm. Like the Clinton dynasty, the Bush dynasty, the name recognition is huge, huge. Uh, I think there was a guy who won in Massachusetts and maybe he's great. I honestly have no idea, but he was a Kennedy. I mean, done, right? Oh, I'm in the JFK orbit family. You know, RFK is my uncle. I'm a Kennedy, American royalty. But that is, that is enough for some people. Is that, you know, Obama's daughters might be geniuses or the opposite. I have no idea. But if they ever want to get in office, it'd be very easy. Just like, oh, I'm Obama's daughter. Like that, that would get probably 40% of the vote. I'm just, what's your campaign? Uh, I don't really want to talk about issues. Did I ever mention to you I'm Obama's daughter? Like, <laughs> his name recognition. Yeah. I mean, seriously, right? That's just all it is. So it's like, there, there, is, there is part of that. Red herring, red herring plus name dropping. <laughs> the name dropping red herring. Guys, guys, I'm continuing. We're just, Brad King, he's fine. just every second interrupting the class, holding us up. We're just, we're just continue. <laughs> just your thing about the name recognition. I, I, I agree, you know, it carries a lot of weight. However, in this day, with the social media and going back forever and digging everything out, the name recognition also brings everybody, all your ancestors' baggage. You know, old Kennedy, yeah, wasn't he a womanizer? Wasn't he all this kind of thing? So, That's a red herring. There's yeah, a, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Or even like, yeah, an- ancestral red herring. Yeah, wasn't your great grandfather arrested for embezzlement? What does that have to do with me, right? Yeah, exactly. Did, did he own slave and like shoot up a saloon in the 1870s in Wyoming? It's like, well, I guess I'm dropping out of the race. You know, like, what? Okay. Appeal to ignorance. Isn't it awesome how many fouls? We're crushing these fouls. Appeal to ignorance. There's no proof Saddam didn't have WMDs, so maybe he did. Maybe she tapped. No. Right, the burden of proof is that he did. Maybe that was the problem with the Iraq War, is that we didn't confirm that he did in fact have this. We just were like, well, I mean, he never claimed he didn't. There's no evidence he doesn't have them. It's guilty until proven innocent otherwise. Right? It's like, yeah, I'll do this deal because there's no evidence that it's, that it's not not good. I mean, you kind of do whatever. Before you do a big company merger or attack a country, it should be the burden of proof is on you to say it's true, not that, oh, I don't know that it's not true. Right? Why did you punch that guy? He didn't do anything to you. I don't know. Is there any evidence he didn't ever insult me in private? I, mean, I don't know that since I punched him. No, it doesn't, right? Appeal to inappropriate authority, relying on someone who has no right, right to weigh in. Well, this guy said it. My son said My son, exactly. My son said this is inappropriate authority. Uh, Mrs. Smith, why do you believe blank, blank, blank? Well, Everyone I know in my church group says it's true. <laughs> Inappropriate authority. Uh, I, Why do you believe that Listerine cures all medical problems? Four and five doctors say it, right? Well, that's kind of an authority. Everybody at <laughs> my church says it. Everybody my church, yeah. Oh, kind of my, my big fat Greek wedding, the Windex, right? The guy, oh, yeah. Just, oh, yeah. <laughs> Wind, that's inappropriate authority. <laughs> group think. This is a great one. And I'm going to define this. Well, I will, but we can just move on. Group think is just right. Everyone here says it. So, so, so. People don't understand this. Like, group think, Protestant epic fail. This guy in this Protestant blog. I mean, I know I have you a Protestant blog already epic fail. But this guy in this Protestant blog was talking about like Catholicism supposedly isn't true. And he's like, well, every Protestant denomination says it's not true. That's great evidence for me, right? So stupid, right? Like, we believe, obviously, the Catholic Church is the church Jesus Christ founded. That whether that's true or not depends upon did Jesus Christ found this church? That that's where the burden of proof is. And we believe yes. So if all believers believe the church, the world is flat. Yeah, yeah, it's not flat. Exactly. Everyone, all everyone in my all of Pullman can take a vote and say the world is definitely flat. It's not flat. That's groupthink though. Well, everyone said it was. I'm a Democrat, you know, democracy. I'm I vote for the majority. So this guy was literally arguing this Protestant article that all the Protestant denominations, of course, tautologically so, to be Protestants, to protest against the church. It is what every Protestant denomination is protesting. They all say the Catholic Church is wrong. Therefore, it's wrong. That's an inappropriate authority argument, right? Uh, All Mormons are mean because everyone I know says Mormons are mean people. Not a good argument, right? Growing up, everyone in my town was like, stay away from them Mormons. Group think stupid, baseless argument, right? Um, ad, ad hominem attack is attacking the person, not the position. 
So political logic, we already talked about straw man, red herring. Here's your number, your trifecta. Uh, Mr. Krzyzewski, is it true that if you become mayor of Moscow, you will push to increase property tax by 5%? Have you seen what Dave Schmidt, my opponent, wrote on Twitter? Have you seen the vile stuff he posts on Facebook? <laughs> avoiding red herring, avoiding the issue, and attacking him personally. He's not fit for office. He's the slave owner, saloon guy. You're already at home. I, I tell all my students at WSU, U of I, here, everybody, always attack the argument, not the person. Ad hominem is one of the most popular fallacies. Trish, why should I listen to anything you say? You're a terrible person. That, 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 that's absolutely illogical, right? Why would you listen to her? You know what she's done? Like, again, ad hominem. Have you seen the scandal that she's involved in? Fine, maybe that's true. But what did she actually say in the argument? Oh, I don't want to address that because she's right. She's right. I, you know, I'm, I lose. So I have to say they're bad, they're bad. Uh, Hillary Clinton, I'm like, I'm not comment high on politically, is the object of a lot of ad hominem attacks. So is Donald Trump, right? In the Clinton versus Trump 2016 election, there's almost no top of the issue, just Clinton's evil Trump's from their, their detractors. Clearly, Clinton, you really want her running the country? She's this witch, blah, 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 is insults. You really want Trump, the sexist, misogynist, awful, racist, xenophobe, like it was all personal attacks on them. Never, what are they actually talking about, right? That's ad hominem attack. Mm -hmm. uh, begging the question, another fallacy, assuming in the premise what you want to get in the conclusion. Another one, misplacing the burden of proof is very similar, very similar to the appeal of ignorance. The Saddam argument, misplacing the burden of proof. The burden of proof should be we know Saddam has WMDs, not we don't know he doesn't, therefore he's attack the country. You get, you get we have the Iraq, uh, Iraq war. Uh, let's see what else. Categorical logic. We're almost done. Um, categorical logic, you know, getting to truths or fallacies from categories. All mice catching cats are good cats. That premise, let's, let's assume that's true, okay? Some black cats are mice catching cats. Therefore, some black cats are good cats. Categorically, that would follow that syllogism works. If it's true, premise number one, that all mice catching cats are good cats. And if premise B is true, some black cats do catch mice. Then it's absolutely true. See, that some black cats are good cats. And the qualifier is really helpful. It's not saying all majority saying that, you know, yeah, right? If, 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 but if, if it's false, that all my sketchy cats can cast, and this, this falls apart, right? And the syllogism always, the premises of A and B don't add up to C is going to be muddy at best and often straight false. Hey, Brian, yeah. Um, as you go through all these, did you say that you're going to be putting all these back in that? That's what I want to do. Like I said, I forgot to do that for today's class. I really want to do that. And you got to get a good laugh out of that, but it's true. I still haven't done it. I still haven't sat down. Like, I really want to do it artistically and well. And I mean that sincerely. Like, so I want to like print out one. Kind of, yeah. Like, yeah, a PDF yeah. that I can send it out. I said on Monday that you. I would have it in person. I lied. Mm -hmm. um, I failed. But yeah, no, I found by the first three classes. Uh, exactly. So I, I want to have it at least by next Monday. So, so you have the cheat sheet in your hands, electronically speaking, or in, I want to have it in person. Again, a big thing here's how I'm going to cop out. Here's the cop out fallacy. Here's the woe is me fallacy, ready? My computer broke, so pity me. <laughs> but yeah, it, it, it's it, also it, a Pullman resident trying to run for mayor of Moscow. You, you, you heard of That's the first scandal. So I heard you don't have residency in the state. So we can't believe exactly. anything. Can't believe anything you say. Because everyone from Washington is crazy anyway, so yeah. Um, Dan Herzog, so we can't trust a thing. Yeah, yeah that, that ad hominem, red herring, straw, I mean, all those spouses. Yeah. yeah. But, but with this cheat sheet, yes, I would like that because we've covered, I'm not going to lie, I haven't actually numbered probably like 61 things. I'd like to find a way to all short note them, combine them somehow into this larger thing that says plumber's logic and these habit with us. And I'm telling you, I'm admitting freely here, there is a disjointed factor to this class. Like our next lecture, I believe, on Monday is going to be about logic at the foundation of the world. We're using a textual analysis of the book of Genesis. This is something as Christians always accept on faith is the inspired inerrant word of God. And, and, and not just with like the sacred text of the Bible, but even other things. I'm not saying that we're going to apply all these things always. We'll have these tools. And like I said, my dream will be maybe we're reading Cicero, who's one of the greatest thinkers of all time, an amazing orator, just unbelievable, you know, intellectual figure. And maybe we're like, this doesn't seem correct. Oh, this is this. Here's my sheet. This seems like this is a straw man. It would be fun that way, you know? So, yes, I would very much like to do that. And, I, and I'm, you know why I, I guarantee to have this? Someone help me out. Why do I guarantee they'll have this done? 
because it's, it's selfish. I want this for myself. Like, so I'm gonna do it for myself. It's the ultimate motivation. If I was doing it for you guys, I'll probably forget. But I'm doing it for me and you. It's a win-win. It's very capitalism. Like all of us win. St. Augustine has an invalid syllogism in one of his really good works. What is it? On the Christian doctrine? That just made, it just made me think of it. But it doesn't mean that the whole work, we would throw out the whole work. Of course not. I, and well, that, even that his conclusion is false. Right. The argument. He well, that's the whole thing too. And good. And that's why we have, we talked about earlier. I don't have that on the sheet. Valid arguments, closure arguments, false arguments. We're going to be picking with a, a fine tooth comb uh, through all this stuff and just kind of separating, to use a great Christian term, separating the, the chaff from the wheat, right? Um, the chaff can be burned with unquenchable fire, putting that off to the side. Whereas putting into our barns, our harvest, you know, our, our golden winter wheat to be used for excellent beer. Our, um, is, is there, I'm just fishing here, but is there another term, I guess, for, if you like or you were wrong beer. about that, so you're wrong about everything. Or, you know what I mean? Yeah, I would say maybe, I don't know off the top of my head, but I would say, yeah, actually, actually, basement. Let's go. Let's go. Let's, go. Let's just do it. Let's get big and large and crush. Yeah, this is seriously, this argument is called, let me see if I can find it here. I do have it. Anyone know what synecdoche means? What is a synecdoche? Almost like synecdoche in New York. Yeah, that's right. what Anyone know what this means philosophically? It is extrapolating the, the whole from the parts. Mm -hmm. Boris Johnson, Boris Johnson, the old British PM, we're going to call him hair. Boris Johnson is not his hair. His hair represents all Boris Johnson. Or the, our favorite quarterback, he's the arm. It's using a, a part of something without part of that argument. I think one part of you, this one stupid thing you said, you support like people dating cats, let's say, and you really do. Yeah. So therefore, you're nuts totally. Maybe you are, maybe, but it's like that's a synecdoche kind of. So it's called the synecdoche fallacy, where it's like you say that that one thing, we just did philosophy in real time, guys. This is cool, seriously. How is that spelled, by the way? Synecdoche, S Y N E. C H O D E, synecdoche. O D E. O D E. O D E. Synecdoche. Mm -hmm. And where is that word? Where does that even come? I have no idea where it comes from, but I know that it does mean that. Okay. Uh, Dave, Dave, we're going to call you tall guy. You know, your height is one feature. You're you're tall. You're you're in bar name, right? Right. It's like just one feature. Everything. I'm yellow. Everyone calls me yellow. I always wear yellow to say yellow sweater, right? I'm not actually, that's not, it's ridiculous. So fallacious. Yellow describes me, you know, totally. Maybe you don't, he's a coward, you know, whatever. Even if it goes, it's everything with yellow. He's a coward. He's a sunny disposition like the sun. He likes yellow. It still is fallacious. It does not cover the whole. You're assuming that's the yellow guy. He wears a yellow shirt. He's yellow. He's sun. He's sun. He's sunny. But those are just kind of outward. Yeah, it, 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 it can be any, but it can be anything. It can be character flaws and character traits. You were 25 years ago, you were, you know, arrested for shoplifting and you made up that mistake by connected out of that. But you're forever a criminal in my mind. The Catholics persecuted Galileo. And so therefore that is that that. So Catholics forever are anti Catholic hate science, they hate rationality because they one time was Galileo. Beautiful. I'm just I'm like so happy exactly it's so, very well so, so for example the saying the jews killed jesus and then go, going on to say that means all jews are bad exactly mm -hmm. or all all japanese people all japanese people um bombed pearl harbor you know the japanese did bomb pearl harbor was every japanese person that plane no or all japanese people? exactly saying the action of a certain group an individual thing a character thing stands in for, for everything Barbara asked him, who? Who champions the world? Well, at one point, the Seattle Supersonics. Got it. Okay, yes. Champions of the world. So they are forever. You would have to say that you would say Seattle, you would, you, the whole city would be glorying in that. Got it. Yes. No, that's, that's brilliant. Yes. The, the champions of the world are those 15 guys playing for the Seattle Supersonics and maybe their general manager, their trainers, part of the organization. But they stand in for the whole city. The 12th man section with the Seahawks. You know, we're all part of the Seahawks. It's our team. Right. Oh, and so the word comes from the Greek 
through um, Latin and Middle English. I just looked up hitting all the notes. Etymology. Awesome. Barbara Aston writes, did Biden say once that if you don't oh. vote for me, you are not black? What kind of attack? Yeah, this would be, I'm trying to think. Yeah, this obviously is a fallacy, right? This is so insulting to African-Americans of like, unless you're a Democrat, you're not really African-American. That's so insulting. And that says, if I'm a black guy, like I must be part of this party. If you don't vote for Biden, you're not a Catholic. He says it's devout Catholics. So you're obviously not a Catholic. You don't vote for Biden. Like those kind of arguments. You're not black. You're not a white woman, really not a Catholic. You're not, you're not really Jewish if you don't support this, if you don't support Israel, you know, only, only true, if you don't support the state of Israel, you're not really, a, you know, a true Jew. Like these kind of arguments, I would say are just, I can't think of what style, they're just, they're false, but they're misdirective almost. They're kind of red herring-like. It's like, to be African-American is a biological reality, right? I'm an African-American man from Mississippi, let's say. I am the red herring changing the focus on my genetic reality to a certain action, a synecdoche kind of one thing that if I don't vote Democrat, then I turn in my black card. That's ridiculous. Yeah. So I, again, I'm not doing a great job with this in terms of, I don't know what the exact fallacy is. It's just false, right? It's saying that unless you act a certain way, maybe it's kind of like holding someone hostage, right? You know, if you don't, if you break up with me, I'm going to jump off a bridge. That's a fallacy, right? You're holding someone hostage. Okay, I guess I got to keep dating this guy because he said he's mm -hmm. going to jump off a bridge. No, that's not right. Yeah, begging the question. Begging the question? Yeah. So, so, yeah, maybe you're begging the question that to be African American means you must be a Democrat. To be uh, Jewish means that you must be a rabid supporter of the state of Israel. You know, even, even things outside the Jewish faith, but just the, the secular state of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, whatever. Right. These would be fallacies. These would be, you know, Things that no, you can be African American. And I know a lot of African American Republicans. I know Jewish people who don't like the state of Israel. Actually, like very pro Palestinian. So it's it's it's, it's can be refuted by evidence that that's not the case. And yet some people, because they want that to be the case, I want every African American to vote for me, the Democratic candidate. I will say these absurd things, right? And like unless you do this, you know, you're not really, you know, you're betraying your own culture. If you guys don't support Biden openly, well, I mean, he's a devout Catholic. So if you don't support him, you're not really a Catholic. And you should probably be excommunicated for not voting for Biden. Sounds ridiculous, right? But it's like some people will make that argument. They do. Uh, and it's it false. It seems like the, 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 the ridiculous emphasis on you know, striving for rhetoric has replaced period. So, oh, man. This is not a new thing. This is, that's a great point by you. This is as old as time. Socrates and a lot of these guys refuted the sophist. Sophistry is one of the oldest fallacies. These guys were really good at saying pretty things that meant nothing. Which is kind of like our politicians today. Okay, you vote for me, ready? Here's can you some can you some uh, summarize and then your platform? Thirty seconds, candidate Jones, go. Yes, I can. If you vote for me, this country will see progress, success, and equilibrium, equity, like never before. I will reverse, subvert, overchange, and implement a new paradigm on top of the old paradigms that were rejected by the way that we've been awoken collectively. As a self-conscious rising from the phoenix of past change must be discarded into the trash bin of the old ways, the old ways not new. And what I bring is a new way of looking at new things that can be said to be a new take on new things. Thank you very much. And that first of all, stop. <laughs> like, yeah, that, that first of all was not even telling him. You get my point. As this kind of stupid parody. People will just say a bunch of things. Oh, it sounded cool, like fancy words, paradigm, equity. But like, what are you actually talking about? And the person himself said, I have no idea. I just want to sound important and smart. But the only real mistake you made is you actually stuck to 30 seconds. I stuck to 30, yeah. They usually, I think one guy was like 212, 213, 214. Like it's like way like triple the time. It's like ridiculous. All right, everyone get out of here. Um, <laughs> it's so, no, guys, I again, I appreciate and truly love you very much. I do. In the kind of ultimate Greek Philadelphia brotherly love. You guys are like family to me. Thank you for being here. Um, tonight is... Uh, uh, AMA. AMA. Yeah, please come. It'd be awesome. We can. Why? Why do you not come? Are are you, is that really? It's too oh, yeah. it's young Guys, again, if Father Chase is requesting that, he is my he is my absolute like king. I like if Father Chase is like the the the, the pa paper papal Caesarism, like in the old days when the Pope was like the local bishop. He's like Father Chase, is like the feudal lord of Augustine. So I submit to his authority. He says only students. I defer to that, and I get it. But like. I don't, is that a rule? I would love to see you there if that's not a rule. If he's requesting that, I humbly 100% as his friend, as his humble servant, submit to him. So then, yes, okay, only students come. But I don't know, is that is that a hard fact? Probably, not? Because he's 
Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Get the smart so I think we're get, get the smart people out of here. Get the young moron. <laughs> I think uh, there may be some youth kind of aspect to it, but all the different practical. Dave, things. just show up wearing tie-dye and be like Woodstock, man. But you guys have typically done this um, at a facility, a restaurant, a bar, whatever. And uh, I think that's part of it. Yeah, kind of Does anyone know why it's Does anyone know why it's here now and not in a bunch of bar? I don't know. This is the first time. This would be the eighth AMA I've done. Uh, the first one was in uh the fall of 19, I think, at like Breakfast Club. Like when I first got here, yeah, it was right away. It's that and this is the first time I've done it not at a restaurant. I've done it at Breakfast Club, then at at um Slice and Biscuit, we've done it at, at what's the Mexican place across the thing here? What is it? Patties. Patties, yes, thank you. It's amazing. No one's on the tip of your tongue. Like, oh, it was not. I would have never got the patty. I was thinking like Ricardo. I just couldn't think of the name. Yeah, patty across here. Um, so we've done it always out. I don't know. I don't know why it's been here, but it's pretty, pretty cool because the place is pretty cramped. So it kind of has this awesome feel, like standing in the morning, pretty sweet. You guys, um, um, I don't think you record these, do you? 